And of course, there was one other thing, and that was 9-11. Ah. Um, and, and also the experiences in, in, in Europe with terrorism. And that really dramatically affected the way George W. Bush right. looked at the options he had. One thing that was surprising about that moment, mm. uh, one thing that was wonderful about that moment is the way in which the West united around, uh, and, and you know, the phrase, we are all Americans, was, uh, mm. was a very warming, heartwarming phrase coming out of, coming out of France. But it, that moment of 9-11 of and others gave most of us a sense of vulnerability we didn't have before. Right. So you've got the combination of globalization making some feel quite vulnerable, terrorist reality of terrorism making some people quite vulnerable. At that moment, a leader has to decide, you know, gee, do I go hellbent for leather? Do I uh, come up with a very dramatic new program? Um, how do I think about constraints? And, and we ended up with the war on terror without a strategy and without a budget. How, how uh, well, I guess that's pretty mm. common, number yeah. one. This is not only George W. Bush that falls into that. Um, right. But how much did uh, the war on terror really reorient the way we thought about the world? Or were we already on the course of, of trying to spread democracy as our central mission? Well, that was certainly the Clinton administration's policy. And as uh, you and I have chatted before, um, Bill Clinton got very lucky in that there are certain things he did as president where the negative consequences only came home to roost after he was president. Uh, so NATO expansion is one where the real backlash happens subsequently. And I think there were some aspects of Clinton's approach to the Middle East, uh, the policy of dual containment, for example, which involved keeping lots of American forces in Saudi Arabia after the Gulf War was part of what led to 9-11 nine, uh, nine as well. Uh, and that, again, happens uh, on Bush's watch, not not Clinton's. But Bush did have a choice. Right? He had to respond to 9-11, but he didn't necessarily have to respond in the way that he did. Um, so he could have, first of all, done something more like Roosevelt. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And of course, the Bush administration went exactly the opposite direction. We're going to uh, inflate this. We're going to make people think that terrorism is really a huge problem that has to be rooted out everywhere around the world. We're going to declare a global war against all violent extremists even though the actual risk to Americans was still remarkably small. He did nothing to try and deflate the threat. He, in fact, did everything to try and make us as scared as possible in order to, in my view, justify, first of all, greater assertions of executive power, something Vice President Cheney had been in favor of for a long time, and then to provide a rationale for the invasion of Iraq, which is something people in his administration had been advocating long before September 11th. So. Um, instead of a very focused campaign against the people who had perpetrated 9-11 against al-Qaeda and say, going to Afghanistan and really focusing on catching them, this became a global campaign, uh, the results of which we all, all have seen. Uh, you know, thousands of lives lost, great instability in parts of the Middle East. The United States will ultimately have spent, you know, four to six trillion dollars on those two wars, which could have been spent in all sorts of more useful ways as well. So Bush had a choice in uh, you know September 12, 2001, and I, in my view, he chose exactly the wrong road. So you, you raised the war in Iraq, and I, I can't help but think that those two wars, Desert Shield of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush meant to push uh, Saddam Hussein back from Kuwait, uh, and Desert Storm, uh, his son's war uh, designed, one of the arguments for it was that it would become a democratic state by getting rid of, if you have regime change, then you'll have a democratic state. Um, what, was the, what was the organizing principle for policy with, with Bush 41? Uh, what, was, what led him to make the choices he made, stop before going into Baghdad? And what was the organizing principle for uh, George W. Bush? Because there were many arguments put forth. Um, well, it, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, was, was, you could argue, the sort of last realist president we'd had. Uh, both he and his uh, close advisor, Brent Scowcroft, really are sort of old-style Republican realists. And I think even though they both recognized that the United States was far and away the most powerful country in the world, they also recognized that 
even the most powerful country in the world faces certain constraints and certain limits. And there's some things that either are har very hard to do, whether you might not even be able to do, or would be unwise to do. So he correctly understood that Saddam Hussein's uh, seizure of Kuwait had to be opposed and reversed for reasons mostly having to do with maintaining a balance of power in the Persian Gulf, ensuring that Iraq didn't become even wealthier, then become more powerful, start threatening other countries in the region. So that had to be reversed. But he also understood that, first of all, international law did matter, and the UN Security Council resolution did not authorize the coalition to go to Baghdad and depose Saddam Hussein. It authorized them to throw Iraq out of Kuwait. Um, secondly, that once you went to Baghdad, you owned the country. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea how to run the place once we got there. And if you uh, are interested, you can find on Google uh, a series of remarks that Dick Cheney made before he became vice president defending the elder Bush's decision not to go to Baghdad. And I only wish that the older Dick Cheney had gone back and listened to the younger Dick Cheney because he identifies very cogently all of the things that subsequently happened. Um, uh, so the elder Bush did understand that you would lose international support instantly. You would end up with uh, a country uh, that would eventually want the United States out, uh, that it would fuel an internal division because Iraq was a deeply divided society that had only been held together by a great deal of coercive force. And unfortunately, his son didn't understand that. His son, I believed, drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, uh, and was convinced that something dramatic had to be done in the Middle East in the wake of 9-11, and in particular, um, that the uh, overthrow of Saddam Hussein would be step one in a process of regional transformation. That first we'd knock off Saddam, then we would put great pressure on the Assad regime in Syria. We would also put great pressure on Iran, and eventually we would take these countries that we didn't like very much to begin with, although we had worked with Assad in the past, and turned them into uh, a sea of pro-American democracies. And of course, once they're flourishing democracies, terrorism won't be a problem either, because we know terrorism never emerges in a democratic society. Not true, but never mind. Um, they really did believe this, and I think they genuinely believed it would be easy to do, and it would be cheap. Uh, and understand that this is happening in the wake of the initial American invasion of Afghanistan. Right, where we go in and throw out the Taliban, and everyone told, or people said, well, wait a second, you know, Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. It defeated the British. It defeated the Soviet Union. Don't go there. And the first six weeks to two months look remarkable. The American military looks magical. The Taliban is gone almost instantly. Well, after the initial experience in Afghanistan, it was very hard to argue we couldn't overthrow Saddam Hussein easily as well. Again, our military can do anything. And of course, in both cases, the problem was not getting rid of the current regime, which were both relatively weak and brittle. The problem was what you did with the society afterwards. And it turns out, you know, removing a government is a whole lot harder than trying to create a new one. Uh, as we should have known, and the American military, for all of its uh, real virtues, uh, is not the right tool for that in any event. So if, if you've got George Herbert Walker Bush uh, focused on, on defending sovereignty, you've got George W. Bush focused on promoting, uh, promoting democracy. When President Obama comes in, um, there has been developed within the UN structure a, a concept called responsibility to protect, right. where you're protecting humanity. I mean, there's this, it, it, it basically argues that um, that every every head of state has an obligation, every leader has an obligation to protect their citizens from mass atrocity. If they fail, the international community has the right and perhaps the obligation to right. step in. So. The first sort of action on that was, was Bill Clinton when it came to Kosovo and Bosnia. Right. And his inaction when it came to Rwanda is probably what haunts him to this day. Obama was faced with Libya and Syria. Right. Very, very different choices and a very different uh, response. What, describe his response to Libya and, and give us your views. Is, is there something else that, that would have been wiser? 
Yeah, o o Obama uh, has said that his decision to support the British and French intervention in Libya and eventually then to topple uh, Muammar Gaddafi was one of his great mistakes as president. He, he now regrets and I think his regret is, is appropriate. Um, not because Muammar Gaddafi was worth defending, but uh, because Muammar Gaddafi uh, had put together this sort of ramshackle state that unfortunately once it disappeared left anarchy and the only thing worse than a very bad government is no government at all. Um, so I think uh, Obama agonized over it. I don't think it was an easy call for him. He was pushed uh, very hard by some of his advisors to do this and eventually agreed to initially go along to, uh, as authorized by the Security Council, to prevent the Libyan government forces from possibly, because we don't know what they would have done, but possibly uh, conducting a massacre in a rebel city, Benghazi. Um, and that mission quickly expanded to become one of aiding the rebel forces who were attacking Gaddafi and eventually uh, throwing him out of power. I think this was a bad idea for two reasons. Uh, one is, of course, what's occurred since then has been essentially a warlord now governed uh, society where they're still fighting uh, each other. So it's been very bad for the Libyan people. Uh, arguably no worse than what preceded, but certainly no better and maybe, maybe worse. But second of all, the United States had promised uh, as part of Libya's decision to disarm, to get rid of all of its own weapon of mass destruction programs, we had promised to leave Muammar Gaddafi in place. That was the quid pro quo. All right, and so it set a very bad precedent However, uh, the United States having promised to leave the guy in place when the next president comes along and participates in his overthrow. And when you think about some other countries out there who we would like to keep from getting weapons of mass destruction, we are setting the wrong lesson. How do you persuade Kim Jong-un to give up his nuclear arsenal? Well, we'll promise him that we'll leave him in place. We won't try to pressure, we don't do regime change. Well, the first case that the North Koreans always point to is Libya, and you can understand why they might, might do that. Uh, it did one final thing, which was that it was one of the many straws that helped, I think, uh, break the back of U.S.-Russian relations as well, because mm -hmm. the Russians had gone along with the Security Council resolution. I believe they abstained on it, yeah. um, right? Authorizing us to go in and protect civilian life, consistent with R2P. Once we did regime change, the Russian reaction was, we can't believe anything you're saying, any assurances you make about your limited objectives in other places. And many people believe this played a role in their response to the Syrian civil war as it broke out as well. That's where I'm gonna, have, gonna take yeah. you, is did we make the right choices with respect to Syria? And, and as, you, as you say, the die was cast as to what the relationship would, whether Russia would be uh, as permissive in this event. Uh, I think Syria is one of the hardest cases to think about because it's impossible to see what's happened to Syria uh, and not f want to have done more to prevent it or to, to stop it. I do think the Obama administration mishandled it in a couple of ways, but not perhaps in the way you're expecting. Uh, first of all, they qu very quickly said Assad must go. Uh, so the American policy, once the uprising began, was that, well, this guy is toast. He should be, uh, he should be removed from power. Even though we hadn't, didn't have a plan for doing it, had no idea what would, uh, or who would replace him, so we shouldn't have said that. Uh, second, Obama himself misspoke in the famous red line uh, statement, which I think was kind of impromptu about chemical weapons use, which he then walked back from, but that undermined his credibility. Third, it is a myth that the United States was not involved supporting the various opposition forces. The United States was involved from the very beginning backing some of the anti-Assad uh, people, not very effectively, but we were there and some other American allies, including Saudi Arabia and uh, some of the Gulf states were also involved backing different forces. What we should have done, in my view, is from the very beginning said, we have to, s we have to shut this down as quickly as possible you know, long before you have a half a million people dead, back when there were 5,000 dead or 10,000 dead. And the problem there, and there was negotiations that we tried to sponsor in Geneva early on to try and bring some kind of accommodation or settlement, but we uh, insisted that Iran could not participate in these negotiations, even though Iran was one of the principal backers of the Assad regime. This was a recipe for complete 
failure because you can't exclude one of the key actors and expect to get an agreement that that actor is going to want to live with. And Iran, whether you like it or not, was in a position to affect that particular outcome. So if we could roll the clock all the way back, uh, we would have been better served to say, we don't like Assad very much, we don't think what he's doing is very good, but we think he might have to stay in power for a while. We're going to organize a peace conference where all the interested parties can come and attend, and we're going to try to shut this down quickly. We are not going to get a perfect outcome here, but we might get an outcome in which a lot of Syrians are still alive and the country hasn't been destroyed. And don't have the migrant crisis. Uh, for then, yes, and uh, lots of other things uh, don't happen as a result of that. By the way, one final point. Obama, I believe, made the decision, rightly or wrongly, not to get more deeply involved, not to use the American military to try and remove Assad, because he believed something like Libya might happen, that it could actually produce a worse outcome, that uh, various al-Qaeda-associated groups might take power, that ISIS might, in fact, uh, emerge as a dominant force within Syria, and you know, therefore removing Assad, loathsome as he might be, might actually be worse than uh, leaving him in there. And you know, people can debate that back and forth, but I think it, 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 there was a valid reason for operating that way. I want to take you to a very different case in the region, and that's Yemen, um, where we, uh, I think we first were involved under the Obama administration because of concern about al-Qaeda in Yemen. Is that right? That's that well, we've actually been involved in Yemen off and on for quite some time, but. And um, but for that reason, primarily, uh, primarily concerned with well, try in several cases trying to promote uh, democracy. We helped engineer the uh, departure of the previous sort of strongman uh, ruler, um, Saleh, and uh, we have intervened in various ways, especially after 9/11 and when an Al Qaeda affiliated group emerged in Yemen. And I would argue to a first approximation, almost every time we've gotten involved, things have subsequently gotten worse. So uh, there's no there's no great success story there yet, mm -hmm. um, and now it's become you know a, a great humanitarian tragedy. Yeah, I mean it's almost unimaginably hor horrible. Right. Uh, famine, cholera. Uh, how do we get out in the in the way that 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 hurts the least, uh, that's most protective of the people? Well, th th uh, is this I a war? Yeah, that I, we <laughs> do we have the leverage with the Saudis to bring this to an end? Um, I think we have leverage with them. It will ultimately, uh, you know, reflect not just the pressure we might be able to bring to bear on Saudi Arabia, but ultimately what happens inside the country uh, as well. I don't think there's any outside power that can come in and sort of dictate a solution mm -hmm. and, and organize it. Um, but certainly, if it were me, I would be uh, making it very clear to Saudi Arabia that we're not, no longer going to support their military actions there. Um, partly because they're, uh, you know, have, have created a humanitarian crisis and partly because they're not successful, mm -hmm. right? It's, this is, you know, worse than a crime, it's a blunder. Um, uh, it's a great humanitarian disaster, but it has also been an unsuccessful military campaign that has not removed the Houthis from, the, uh, from power in the areas uh, they control. And for both of those reasons, this war should be uh, shut down immediately, and we are in not necessarily a position to dictate uh, a solution to it, but we can certainly stop supporting the military campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons that we, well, I think you argue that the primary reason that we have kind of gotten into this uh, kind of consensus that it makes sense for us to be exporting democracy and that we can, um, and that we can, I think it's a narrower consensus, that we can using force. Um, I, you argue that part of the problem is that the foreign policy elite just talk to each other, uh, that there's not a great distance between uh, the, the, the conservatives and the liberals, um, that is, it is, uh, it's an echo chamber. And in fact, you use the phrase of the blob <laughs> to describe us. And, and I should note that you include in the blob World Affairs <laughs> Councils. <laughs> <laughs> so um, everybody should, should uh, start worrying about being in the blob. <laughs> uh, define the blob. Yeah. So the, the term the blob was actually coined by Ben Rhodes, who was uh, Deputy <laughs> National Security Advisor uh, for Obama. And I don't use it very often. Uh, because I actually think of the foreign policy community or the foreign policy elite as somewhat broader than what he meant. What he meant by the blob was really inside the beltway think tanks and 
the various folks who are constantly uh, engaging in, in debates about foreign policy inside Washington. And uh, he used this as a sort of derogatory term to talk about how hard it was for Obama. You know, do anything and the blob starts resisting <laughs> you in, in various ways. Uh, World Affairs Councils are maybe part of the periphery of that, but uh, you, you are a force for good uh, <laughs> overall. The, however, the point I, I make about the sort of broad foreign policy community is first, it's a pretty consensus-based group. You think of politics and foreign policy as being you know, sharp elbows and lots of infighting, but in fact, there is remarkable consensus on the broad outlines of foreign policy. And you can see that in multiple ways, and I have a lot of evidence in that, uh, in that particular chapter. But you know, just one sign of it is the reaction of uh, foreign policy experts to the arrival of Donald Trump. So, of course, his candidacy is opposed by the Democratic Party and the army of foreign policy advisors who were helping Hillary Clinton. She had like 200 VIPs signed up, you know, as advisors to her campaign on foreign policy, as befits a former Secretary of State. But Republicans were, if anything, more vehement in their opposition to Trump, right? Uh, some of you may remember there were several open letters signed by over 100 former Republican national security and foreign policy officials condemning Trump in really remarkable terms. One of these letters calls him utterly unfit for office. And again, I reiterate, these are Republicans writing about Trump after he's the nominee. Right? And so you sort of say, well, what's going on here? Well, it's because there was, in fact, this considerable bipartisan consensus on the uh, United States from being the number one power in the world, constantly exercising global leadership, being indispensable, to use Madeleine Albright's phrase, and to be using its power uh, to promote classic American liberal values far and wide, to try and as much as possible to transform the world in America's image, peacefully if we can, but in some cases through the use of military force. And Trump rightly or wrongly, had taken dead aim at many of those sort of key principles in some of his speeches and remarks. This was horrifying to, quote unquote, the blob, which is why both the Republicans and Democrats within it opposed him. And it's why when he ended up getting elected, he had hardly anybody available to appoint to any key positions because there was nobody on his team who had much experience, much knowledge. And it's one of the reasons you've seen such a haphazard foreign policy coming out of Washington ever since. So, so he stood up to the blob, or uh, rejected the thinking of the blob. He didn't embrace uh, what, you, what you refer to as liberal hegemony, no. promotion of democracy. So you should be very happy. No. Okay. <laughs> no, there's a chapter in the book called how, how Not to Fix Foreign Policy, and that's the chapter about Trump. Um, and the basic argument I make there is, in fact, Trump's style as president and his approach to foreign policy is radically different. I mean, we've never had a president who sort of does foreign policy by Twitter, who will throw candies at the chancellor of Germany, will insult other American allies with some frequency, seems to be very comfortable so with some pretty objectionable uh, dictators. Uh, in terms of style, this is radically different. And in a couple of areas, uh, trade being one, um, he really has departed in some respects uh, from, from what his predecessors have done. Although remember, you know, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. Uh, George W. Bush imposed tariffs on steel uh, at, in his first term as well. So even Trump's trade playbook is not uh, totally different. But if you look at the substance of the Trump foreign policy, it's not that different, right? We're still in NATO. Uh, China was regarded as an emerging rival before Trump. He's uh, embraced that agenda in various ways. We're still backing the same set of allies in the Middle East. If anything, we're just backing them more strongly. Yes, he did get out of the Iran nuclear deal, but that was the one issue that there was really deep division in Washington over whether that was a good idea or not. Uh, the Obama administration had to work very hard to get that through. So he's kind of sided with the other faction on this one. It's not a 180 in terms of U.S. foreign policy. He sends more troops to Afghanistan, just like Obama did. Remember in the first year, the surge in Afghanistan? Trump does a smaller version, but does the same thing under uh, military pressure as well. So if you look at the substance, there are differences, but they're not nearly as profound. And I view that as, in some respects, the establishment as reining Trump in, is keeping him, despite all of his instincts, uh, from doing what he said he was going to do in, in the campaign.
The problem is that they're doing, uh, he's doing all of these things ineptly. So he's serious about confronting China on trade. If you were really serious about doing that smartly, you'd line up Japan, South Korea, the EU, Canada, Mexico behind that agenda and get us all as a united front confronting China over its trade practices. What does Trump do? He picks a fight with all of those countries. So it's the United States versus all of these different countries on, uh, on trade. Um, he doesn't like the EU very much and he doesn't like NATO very much. Well, if you want the United States out of NATO, so you don't have to defend the Europeans anymore, then you'd like Europe to be stable, peaceful, tranquil. You'd like the EU to be working really well because it's a principal guarantor of stability and tranquility in Europe. So you wouldn't want to tear up the EU at the same time that you're questioning uh, NATO as well. Um, if you're serious about North Korea's nuclear program, Trump correctly figured out that military force was not an option, something that every other American president has figured out, that you had to rely on diplomacy, but you have to rely on serious diplomacy with some prior preparation as opposed to reality show diplomacy where you go off to Singapore, have a big photo op, get lots of publicity for it, great audience share, and come away with nothing. The uh, actual agreement in uh, Singapore is a meaningless agreement. North Korea has not committed itself to doing anything and indeed has not done anything since then. So, uh, you know, I uh, basically say we have the worst of both worlds now. We're still running this very ambitious foreign policy where we're trying to solve problems all over the world, but we're doing it with the least competent president.